today we're going to talk about four reasons why your concussion symptoms might get worse with physical activity. We're going to talk about blood flow issues, visual vestibular issues, cervical spine issues, and metabolic inflammatory issues. Hey, I'm Dr. Mark. So I've worked almost exclusively with concussion and post-concussion for the last five years. And in that time, I've cleared over 500 people from NCAA swimmers to professional ice hockey players to entrepreneurs, teachers, parents, high school athletes, JV, varsity, everyone in between. On this channel, we discuss concussion rehab, how to get rid of symptoms, and how to get back to your work, your school, your sport, or just your regular life. The conundrum here is that physical activity exercise is arguably the best thing that you can do for your concussion post-concussion recovery. So as early as two days after after your injury all the way to years after your injury, we know that steady state aerobic exercise is probably like the drug of choice for rehabbing almost any concussion symptom that you have. But the problem is that sometimes exercise, physical activity makes you feel worse. So to unravel this issue, we're going to talk about the five main symptom generators that we have in concussion and why four of those might make you feel worse with physical activity. Concussion and post-concussion are tricky because they're invisible injuries. You can't see it. There's not a bruise. There's not a cast that you wear. We can't see it on imaging. There's no blood test yet that can really definitively diagnose concussion. We might be able to see in the blood who needs a CT scan or not, but that doesn't tell us who has concussion or not. So it's really this invisible tricky injury. So what causes the symptoms? Over the last few decades, research has really been dialing in on what we call symptom generators. What is actually generating the symptoms? We've got five that we think are there. We've got autonomic blood flow dysregulation, metabolic. So think inflammation, hormones, even your gut dysregulation. We've got visual vestibular dysfunction. We've got cervical spine dysfunction. And then there's also like a psychological overlap. Anxiety, depression, PTSD can make all those generators worse. And all those generators can make anxiety, depression, PTSD worse. And so you got this overlap where if you've got pre-existing anxiety, a family history of anxiety, or there's trauma related to the incident, that can all make symptoms worse. So we're not going to go into the why and the how and the nitty gritty of all of these. We're just going to answer the question, why does exercise make my concussion symptoms worse? And let's start with autonomic blood flow dysregulation. That's actually a really low hanging fruit place to start. So your autonomic nervous system can be sort of thought of as like your automatic nervous system, your background nervous system. It does all the things we should be grateful for because we don't have to think about it, like getting blood to the right places at the right time in the right amounts. How many times a day do you think about putting blood to your pinky so it doesn't turn purple? right? That's pretty cool. So in the brain, we regulate blood flow with four main mechanisms. We regulate it based on CO2 levels, based on blood pressure levels, based on your sympathetic, parasympathetic, so your fight or flight, your rest and recover based on that balance. And then we also regulate it based on brain activity levels. We want to send blood to the areas of the brain that are more active rather than sending it to places that aren't so active. So after a concussion, probably due to the rotational forces, probably due to like the global cerebral jostling, which is a technical term, we can see that each of these blood flow mechanisms gets impaired or wonky to some degree. Specifically, we see overreactive responses to blood pressure. We see that you're highly sensitive to CO2 and we see a general sympathetic shift. So like a general shift towards a fight or flight sort of resting state. And we'll see that reflected in HRV and other metrics. But you put that all together and you get erratic blood flow. At times you have too much, at times you have too little, and you get these hyper reflexive shifts between the two. So to zoom out, ask yourself, do you think it's important to have steady blood flow to the brain, even under different different circumstances like mental or physical activity? Of course. So having impaired blood flow is a really low-hanging fruit, a really simple mechanism to explain a lot of concussion PCS symptoms, particularly during physical activity. So having too much blood flow can feel like pressure. Having too little blood flow can feel like brain fog and dizziness. Blood flow is everything. You want the right amount at the right time. Next, we're going to talk about visual vestibular dysfunction. So these symptoms are quite common after post-concussion. We've got like headaches, eye strain, dizziness, vertigo, blurry vision, light sensitivity, brain fog, fatigue, etc. So name a symptom and we could tie it back to the eyes and the ears. And many of these symptoms are worsened during physical activity, particularly if the activity in it is in a busy visual environment. So think a crowded gym, think a crowded coffee shop, even just a regular grocery store with the different colors down the aisle. One of the things that we test for after concussion that relates to this is your vestibular ocular reflex or your VOR. So we look, is this accurate? Is Does it provoke symptoms? So your VOR is actually a reflex that ensures that objects stay stable as your head and your body are moving. So if I want to keep the camera lens stable as I move my head to the left, my eyes move sort of equal and opposite to the right. And if it doesn't do this, the world kind of looks like the Blair Witch Project. What we don't realize is that daily activities occur in a range of two to six hertz. That's around 120 to 360 beats per minute. So when we test your VOR in a VOMS, we do that at three hertz or about 180 beats per minute. And you can imagine going tick, 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 
you need that level of VOR activity, VOR accuracy in order to move through the world doing normal day-to-day -day activities. So again, keeping this really simple and zoomed out, imagine that you can't keep your eyes steady on a target as your head and your body move. Of course, you're gonna feel gross. The third factor we're gonna look at is cervical spine dysfunction. And we're gonna jump right into this because it is so tightly tied to the eyes and the ears, that visual and vestibular system. So remember in my recent video where I talk about how easy is it to get a concussion, I talk about whiplash and concussion and how on paper they're nearly identical. So from symptoms alone, we actually can't tease them apart. And guess what? Your neck significantly affects how your eyes move and how you perceive yourself in space. We know that your vertebrae, your spine bones here, C1, 2, and 3, are significant drivers of proprioception and body awareness. And part of that body awareness is playing nicely with your visuals, so your eyes and your ears, your vestibular system. Without going too deep into the weeds, I kind of wanted to talk about this because it's interesting. So research from the early 2000s in monkeys showed us that if we inactivate a neural integrator, so this area that integrates a whole bunch of information to make sure your eyes kind of do the math appropriately, that's called the interstitial nucleus of Cajal in the upper brainstem. Basically, if we inactivate that area, that neural integrator, we could induce something that looked a lot like cervical dystonia or torticollis. And so this research, along with other papers, really drives home the connection between the eyes and the neck. If we inactivate an eye area, we get a neck response, which is really interesting. So again, zoom out, keep it really simple. Turn your head to the left with your eyes open. So if we go like this, which system was active? Was it your visual? Was it your vestibular? Or was it your proprioception, your cervical? Trick question, all of it. If your eyes were open, you saw the room move, your vestibular system felt the room move, and your neck actually did the moving. It felt the moving as well. So if you're having trouble with visual environments, if you're having trouble with exercise, with head movement, with upper body movements that kind of get the neck and upper traps involved, your neck is likely a driver of symptoms during physical activity. Now, the last of the symptom generators that may make exercise feel worse is your metabolic health, your metabolic status. This could be its own series of videos. So we're going to keep it very surface level and simple because human metabolism is complex and fascinating and amazing. But zooming out and keeping it really, really simple from the start, how healthy were you entering the injury? Did you have hypothyroidism? Did you come into the injury with anemia, vitamin D deficiency, diabetes? So a common example that I see is in my young female athletes with like these really hard to treat headaches or dizziness or brain fog or sleep issues. But when we run labs, one of the markers I'll test for is ferritin, which is a marker of iron storage. And what we find is that that marker is really low and some of the other metrics in their labs look like subclinical anemia. So they don't have an overt iron deficiency anemia, but it's heading that way. And so when we treat with, you know, whatever's appropriate, I'm not going to give medical advice here, but when we treat with whatever's appropriate, we find that symptoms improve, headaches go away. The problem with anemia goes back to blood flow. It looks like an autonomic issue. We can't deliver oxygen appropriately with iron deficiency anemia and too low of oxygen, headaches, brain fog, dizziness, etc. So after that, after the injury, let's say we're already injured, we, we have our metabolic health now that we're managing now, are you kind of eating a Western standard American diet? We have lots of research that shows, we're growing research that shows that that's going to worsen symptoms, blunt responses to treatment, and prolong post-concussion. We know that if you're not hydrating properly, healthy non-concussed people, when we dehydrate them, feel and perform concussed. So just from a simple metabolic standpoint, big picture, how's your overall health and are you maintaining that before and after the injury? And last but not least, we'll touch on the fifth symptom generator. Folks with the primary symptom generator that is psychologically different and driven. We got the anxiety, depression, PTSD overlap. Those folks often feel better with exercise, better with physical activity. The classic patient that I'll see is the one where their whole vibe like literally shifts during the Buffalo concussion treadmill test. They don't have exercise intolerance. In fact, it probably makes them feel better. And this is not to neglect or underplay the significance of mental health and concussion. Cognitive behavioral therapy, dialectical behavioral therapy, acceptance, commitment therapy, uh, biofeedback, all these are excellent tools with a trained therapist are excellent tools and in, in a crucial part of many folks' complete concussion recovery. However, just as a note, psychological symptom generators, when that's the primary one, often doesn't impair your exercise tolerance. On the flip side, exercise often improves that symptom. So to wrap it up, if you struggle with symptoms during physical activity or exercise after your concussion, you basically need to look at everything. I say that sort of jokingly, but also honestly, blood flow. Do you tolerate gravity? Can you tolerate normal steady state aerobic exercise? Metabolics, do you have pre-existing conditions? Do you take care of yourself after in terms of diet, hydration, sort of a recovery plan? Do you have any undiagnosed conditions going on there? Visual, vestibular, cervical function. How well do your eyes, your ears, and your neck play together? It can be as simple as one missing piece or as messy as kind of juggling all of those at once figuring out a way to get you to exercise, to improve autonomic function without too much head movement and 
the game kind of goes from there. So chatting with a concussion literate provider can be the best way to sort this out. If you'd like to have that particular conversation with me, you can schedule a free concussion consult at the link below or visiting my website. I appreciate you sticking around. If you enjoyed this video or learned something from it, you'll probably also enjoy or maybe at least learn something from these other ones as well. Until next time, I'm Dr. Mark. Thanks for watching.